Well, good morning, friends. How do I know I'm spending the morning with a group of creatives? We have cake and cookies for breakfast, right? <laughs> it's almost like you people spend your days challenging the status quo or something. What's going on here? Uh, it is really good to be with you this morning. And as you heard, I've been tasked with talking about bravery this morning. And I think that is a, a very apt conversation for us to have as creatives, because I think that creativity and bravery are, are two sides of the same coin. Sort of like structure and freedom are two sides of the same coin. I think creativity and bravery are also two sides of the same coin. It is impossible to execute a creative act without bravery. But I think sometimes we, we confuse what bravery means, specifically in the creative process, because creativity on a day-to-day -day basis, those of us who, how many of you would qualify yourself as a creative, as somebody who turns your thoughts into value on a daily basis? It's what you do, right? You solve problems. How many of you solve problems every day? Yes, how many of you solve other people's problems? Every day? That's what we do, right? We solve problems. That's what creatives do for a living. But with that comes a daily battle against uncertainty. And really, that's what creativity is. It's, it's assaulting uncertainty on a daily basis. It's taking dissonance in your environment, things that don't seem to add up, and you weave a solution together that solves that problem, that brings some kind of meaning to that uncertainty. Well, facing uncertainty on a daily basis is something that demands a lot of us. It demands a lot intellectually and emotionally. Right? It requires bravery. The problem is that often I think we think of bravery as those people who muster up one courageous act of the will, and they assault something one time, right? And that's it. That's what bravery is. In reality, bravery is something slightly different. And that's what I want to talk about today, because over time, if we don't learn to deal with our fear, and we don't learn to confront uncertainty consistently day by day, we will eventually slip into a place of mediocrity, and none of us want that, right? None of us want to be, nobody wakes up in the morning thinking, I can't wait to crank out a steaming pile of crap today, right? Nobody does that. <laughs> and yet it happens over time, slowly, as we make choices. Um, and typically those choices are the anti-brave choice. Now this word mediocrity is interesting to me because it comes from two words in the original language, medius and ochris, which means middle and rugged mountain. So to be mediocre literally means to stop halfway up a rugged mountain. It means to stop halfway to your objective. And unfortunately, I find many brilliant, talented, amazing, sharp creatives who over time, they start off strong, but they eventually settle medius ochris. And I would submit to you that often it's because of a lack of willingness to engage in these everyday acts of bravery over time. So why does this happen? What are these everyday acts of bravery that we have to engage in, I believe? Well, I think we have to step back first and realize that everything that you and I, and we do today, is ultimately building a body of work, right? We are building a body of work every day through where we put our focus, our assets, our time, and our energy. It's the sum total of value that we create. So when we create value, it contributes to that body. We're doing it right now, by the way. Right? Sitting here, engaging, thinking, sharpening yourself. This is part of building your body of work. And at the end of your life, you will point to a delta, a sum total of change that exists in the world because you sucked air on this earth. Right? It's all of the value that you created over the course of your life. But I think for many of us, we, we think about that. We think about that delta, that change that we want to create as a creative, as somebody who turns thoughts into value, who creates meaning out of disorder. We think about that big delta, that big body of work that we want to build, and it, it can become paralyzing to us because it seems often overwhelming. We look at the peak of the mountain and we say, I don't, I don't know how I'm going to get there. And, and the pursuit of that peak can, can wear on us over time. It can wear us down. 
And what we fail to realize often is that that big body of work, that big delta that we're building, the big change that will exist, that we will point to at the end of our life and say, does that represent what I care about? Is actually comprised of a lot of little deltas, a lot of little changes, little choices every single day about where we put our focus, our assets, our time, and our energy. Your fate determines your fate, right? Not to be too cutesy, but your focus, assets, time, and energy ultimately determine the body of work that you build. But sometimes we look at the big delta and we fail to pay attention to those little choices that we make on a daily basis that actually build up into that big delta. As Gretchen Rubin put it, I think brilliantly, what you do every day matters more than what you do once in a while. Right? The choices that we make on a daily basis matter so much more than what we muster up our will and our strength and our courage to do every so often. So the principle here is that mediocrity, medius ochris, doesn't just happen. It's chosen over time. It's chosen in small ways, small compromises that we make along the way, on a daily basis, as we confront uncertainty. And so the countermanding principle there, and this is what I've been telling people uh, in, in the wake of the launch of, of the book that I just launched about a month and a half ago, is brilliance demands discipline. But I'm actually going to modify that. And I think I'm going to modify it maybe moving forward when I, when I speak to groups. I think brilliance demands bravery. And it doesn't just demand the mustering up of the will one time. It demands daily, consistent assault on our apathy. The creative process is the perpetual assault on the beachhead of apathy. It's waking up every day and saying, I'm going to assault this beach come hell or high water. And I might get wiped out right, in my effort to do it. But I'm going to assault apathy today because I believe I have something valuable to offer my clients, the marketplace, and the world. What I do today is building up into that big body of work. So there are seven acts of bravery, everyday acts of bravery, that I want to introduce to you today. That I think that as creatives, we not only have the, the opportunity to engage in, but I believe we have the responsibility to engage in on a daily basis. You know, Viktor Frankl said the Statue of Liberty on the East Coast should be accompanied by the Statue of Responsibility on the West Coast. <laughs> Right? This idea that with opportunity, with the freedom of expression, with the gifts, the talents, the amazing ability we have to turn chaos and disorder into meaning, comes a responsibility not to use that in the service of ourself, but to use it in the service of other people. And to pursue our aptitudes to the best of our ability and refine them and develop them and be courageous and brave in how we approach our work each day. But again, that's the result of small choices on a daily basis. So here are the seven acts of bravery. I think we are called to be responsible in engaging every day. The first is to define your battles. We will ultimately be remembered, and our body of work will be built upon the battles we choose to spend our time fighting as creatives. The battle lines you draw, that's what you're going to be remembered for. But it's easy to get lost in a wash of projects and work, right? and to lose our bearings and to forget what it is that really drives us. And I think sometimes the courage that's required is to choose a battle to fight. Sometimes we're afraid to choose. We're afraid to choose because we're afraid we'll choose the wrong thing. And that's what uncertainty does to us. But we have to be willing to put our skin in the game somewhere. Right? By way of illustrating this, let me utter the most terrifying words ever uttered by a human being. Let me show you a magic trick I just learned. Okay? All right. So. <clears throat> There are five cards on the screen. I want everyone to choose one card, just one card, and focus on that card. I'm going to do a mind meld with you. Everybody have your card? Just nod when you have your card. OK? I don't believe you. OK, good. Very good. All right, I'm going to take the five cards away. I'm going to shuffle them. I'm going to put four of those cards back up on the screen. How many people see your card? Nobody? <laughs> Greatest magic trick ever. Actually, these are four entirely different cards than the ones I put up the first time, right? <laughs> By the way, those of you who raised your hands, I'll talk to you after. I have people I can refer you to. It's fine, right? <clears throat> Why does this trick work? Well, first, try it, try it at home. It will amaze and astound your friends. It will. Why does it work? It works because I gave you a problem to focus on, and you performed brilliantly on that problem. You did. You executed brilliantly, every single one of you, with a couple of exceptions, right? You performed brilliantly. But in so doing, you miss the context for the problem that I gave you. 
And I would submit to you that many of us as creatives, we get so obsessed with solving problems, with doing projects, that we fail to step back and ask, why are we doing this? What is the greater battle that we're trying to fight in solving this problem? And so we get off course. We don't, we're not brave enough to step back and ask, is this a worthy problem to be fighting? Are we even solving the right problem here? And that is an everyday act of bravery that we need to have as creatives. We need to be willing to question and define battles appropriately. We have to identify our productive passion. Now, this word passion, again, in the root word, comes from the word that means to suffer. Right? We think of passion as, oh, it's something I'm mildly interested in. So I'm passionate about ice cream, and I'm passionate about the Bengals, maybe. And I'm passionate <laughs> about my wife, right? Well, clearly those are different things. Right? I clearly am more passionate about the Bengals than I am about ice cream. Probably not my wife. Right? Yeah, but, but the thing is this. What we have to ask ourselves when we talk about passion is what work am I willing to suffer on behalf of? What work keeps me coming in early, leaving late, causes me to put a little more of myself into the work? Right? Those are the areas of productive passion where we need to be focusing our efforts. And that's an act of bravery because those aren't necessarily the places that other people in the marketplace are going to place value. But we have to have the courage to say, these are the battles that are important to me. Does anyone know who this guy is? A football player. <laughs> Brilliant. <laughs> Wonderful. Thank you. Good night. So, yeah. <laughs> this, is, uh, this is a guy named Curtis Martin, OK? Um, I'm in a group of creatives. What was I thinking with the football <laughs> um, Curtis Martin, right? Curtis Martin was recently inducted into the NFL Hall of Fame as one of the greatest running backs in recent memory. Brilliant, brilliant football player, amazing football player. So he gets up last year to give his Hall of Fame enshrinement speech. You can imagine there's just the testosterone in the room. Arr! You know, you've got all these football greats gathered, all these pundits are there, you know, and everybody's ready to talk football and about how beautiful football is, how wonderful football is. Curtis Martin gets up to give his enshrinement speech, and some of the first words out of his mouth are these. You know, I never was a football fan. I wasn't the type of guy to watch football. I could probably count on one hand how many football games I've watched from beginning to end in my lifetime. Here's a guy being inducted as one of the greatest running backs in recent memory, basically saying, you know, not really a fan of the game. Right? <laughs> Curtis Martin went on to explain that the reason he played football to begin with was because he grew up as a, a child of a broken home, grew up on the streets, really difficult neighborhood. His mom pushed him into football as a way to keep him out of trouble, keep him off the streets. And he actually obviously found out he was really good at it. He played high school football, played college football. At the end of his college career, on NFL Draft Day, this is like the pinnacle of any player's career, NFL Draft Day, he gets a call from Coach Parcells of the New England Patriots. And Coach Parcells says, Curtis, We'd like to know if you'd like to be a New England Patriot. And Curtis Martin replies, yes, coach. Yes, I'd like that very much. Thank you. Click, turns around to his family, says, oh my gosh, I do not want to play football. <laughs> One of the people present that day was a guy named Leroy Joseph, who was a, a family friend. And Leroy Joseph said, hold on a minute, Curtis. You know all those people that you've always said you would like to help if you had the, the chance to help them? All those kids from broken homes? all of those families that are in difficult circumstances that you've always said you would like to help if you had a chance. Maybe football is your platform to be able to help those people. Curtis Martin went on to explain that that became his connection with the game of football. He showed up before everybody else. He left after everybody else. He put more of himself into the game, not because he loved the game, not because he loved the tasks he was doing, because he was committed to an outcome that transcended his day-to-day -day tasks. He had tapped his productive passion. I think when we talk about passion, we often confuse passion for work with passion for tasks. If I'm not interested in the tasks, I'm not passionate about my work. What I think we have to do is have the courage to say, I'm willing to do what I'm great at because I'm committed to an outcome, even if I don't always like the tasks in front of me. Because it's not about me, it's about the outcome. It's about the people that I'm serving. As creatives, we have the ability to transform the world, to change the way people see the world. That is a responsibility, and it requires courage. So what is your productive passion? What outcome are you committed to? That's the first act of bravery. The second is we have to be fiercely curious. Be fiercely curious. There's a group of people that I like to call the busily bored. Right? These are people who are very active. They have a lot going on in their world. 
very active. They're always bouncing from thing to thing to thing, and they look like they're very busy, but they're bored silly. Let's face it, they're bored silly. How do we know that they're bored silly? Well, because the first moment there's even a, a, a moment of lapse in any kind of stimulation, what happens? Yeah, right? The phone comes out of the pocket. How many people would be brave enough to say you've checked your work email at some point before you got up this morning? How many people have checked your email since I started my presentation? Let's be more honest. Yeah, right? It's everything I can do not to grab my phone right now. Why? Because we have been trained that anytime there's a lapse, anytime there's a pause, we need stimulation. You know, we have more technology in our pocket than they used to send people to the moon, and we use it to hurl birds at pigs, right? <laughs> what is this all about? I think it's because we are now in a place where it's really easy for us to entertain ourselves 24-7. And we sometimes confuse that with curiosity. Oh, I'm browsing my world. No, you're looking at Gawker, right? You're, I mean, I'm not saying there's anything wrong with that, and, but what I'm saying is this. We're not staying with problems. We're not asking deeper questions. We're, we're uncomfortable with white space, but white space is where brilliant ideas emerge. So we have to be brave enough to go counterculture, to build white space into our world, to block out the noise and say, I'm going to sit with the problem. And honestly, one of the reasons we don't like to ask questions is because we're afraid of the implications of the answers we might get. If we ask a question and we get an answer, we're accountable to act on that answer. And sometimes we don't want the answer because it's easier just to do what's in front of us. It's an act of bravery to ask better, deeper questions and to stay with the problem. As creatives, we have a responsibility to stem the tide of information that's washing over us, to, to build white space in our life, to stay with the problem. So where am I busily bored is a question you can ask yourself. Right? Have the bravery to stand against the tide. The third act of bravery, daily bravery, is to step away from comfort. I believe the love of comfort is often the enemy of greatness in our life. Because it lulls us into a state of inactivity. It lulls us into a state of assuming everything is fine. Everything is great, right? We get halfway up the rugged mountain and we say, eh, I thought I was going to go here, but this is close enough. right? It's an abdication of your contribution. The love of comfort is often the enemy of greatness. You cannot pursue great work and comfort simultaneously. They are mutually exclusive objectives. Now, you might experience comfort along the way. I mean, we all like nice meals and nice places to live and all that. That's fine. But at some point, if you begin to choose comfort over brilliant work, you're compromising your contribution. And eventually, when you look at your delta, you'll say, that doesn't represent me. And this is where a lot of people get off course. Right? It is an act of bravery to stand against comfort and say, I'm going to step outside of my comfort zone today. I'm going to do something. To walk, as my friend Thad Cockrell says, I'm going to walk into a dark room and turn the light on. And it might be a man-eating lion in there. I don't know. But I'm going to walk in and turn the light on. Because that is what creativity is. It's stepping away from your comfort zone. It's committing to personal growth and innovation. We love to talk about innovation on a corporate level. We love to talk about it. But we don't talk about innovation on a personal level. What are you doing today to prepare you not just to take advantage of opportunities tomorrow, but to, but to spot opportunities tomorrow, to be able to problem find the seeds of tomorrow's brilliance are planted in the soil of today's activity. So what are you doing to step out of your comfort zone? The fourth act of comfort is, or of comfort, yes, the fourth act of comfort. The fourth act of bravery is to be honest with yourself about your abilities. How many people would admit that you watch or have watched at some point the show American Idol? Okay. How many of you would admit that you really only watch maybe the first four or five episodes of every season? Yeah, me too. Why? Because that's when the parade of freaks comes across the stage, right? <laughs> and it's really easy to make fun of people when they get up on stage and they, their drunk friends tell them they're awesome because they sing karaoke at the Silver Spur, you know, every Friday night or whatever. It's really easy to make fun of people. But there are a lot of people out in the marketplace who are doing a similar thing. They're living a false narrative. They're trying to be something they think other people want them to be instead of being honest with themselves about who they are, what they offer the world. Right? It is an act of bravery to be honest with yourself about your aptitudes. And there are a lot of narratives that drive us to try to do things that maybe are not true to who we are. And we have to have the courage 
to stand against that and say, I'm going to know myself and bring who I am to what I do every day. Because otherwise, we are fighting a losing battle from the get-go. It is an act of bravery to know yourself. So as creatives, we have a responsibility to do so. We have to be confidently adaptable. This is about countermanding ego. It's interesting, I wrote an article um, for 99U that was sent out to their, their two million subscribers um, as kind of the featured article the other day. And I couldn't believe, it was about ego. I couldn't believe the kinds of responses we were getting. I'm like, that's the whole purpose of the article, right? And you're kind of responding with ego. I don't get it. Okay, that's fine. <laughs> but there's a difference between confidence and ego. And when we approach our work from a position of ego, it's the coward's way. We are protecting ourselves. We're putting ourselves ahead of the work. Confidence says, I can get this right. Ego says, I can do no wrong. Confidence says, I'm valuable. Ego says, I'm invaluable. These are fundamentally different ways of seeing the world. And when we approach the world from a place of ego, we're putting ourselves ahead of the work. We're protecting ourselves at the expense of our teammates, the expense of the value. It is the coward's way. We have to be confidently adaptable. I'm moving headstrong in the direction I think is right, but I'm willing to listen to disconfirming information. I'm willing to listen when other people disagree with me. Take it into account and then move forward. There's a dynamic that Jim Collins calls hubris born of success, which means you assume future success based on past success. And it is not a way to live. It's a coward's way to live. Chest thumping is not allowed, okay? As a creative, we must be confidently adaptable. But ego doesn't always look like, hey, look at me, look how great I am, I am brilliant, look at me, look at my amazing feats, kneel before Zod, right? That's not always what ego is. Sometimes ego looks like, oh, oh, you're not gonna listen to my idea? I'm gonna take my marbles and go home. Oh, you're not gonna let me contribute in this meeting? I'm gonna just withhold my value from now on because you clearly don't understand how amazing I am, how special I am. It's a form of ego. It's victimhood. You're putting yourself ahead of the work. And guess what? People who do that spend days, weeks, months, years playing the victim. And 5, 10, 20 years down the road, they say, what did I do? I let someone else control my contribution. Someone else control my engagement. And they abdicate their contribution. And they compromise their body of work. It is the coward's way. We have to be confidently adaptable. It's our responsibility as creatives. We have to find our voice. We have to find our voice. You have to be willing to sail perpendicular to the shoreline. We all imitate because it's an important way to build our platform, to develop our skills, but at some point we have to have the courage to sail perpendicular. We have to counter fear. You see, fear turns something innocuous into something terrifying. That's what fear does. <laughs> And it will cause us to be paralyzed, hovering in the corner. There's a guy named Neil Fiore who works with people about procrastination. And he'll often ask them, uh, he'll put, a, put, the, put them in a room with a wood plank about 10 feet long. And he'll say, could you walk the length of that wood plank if I ask you to? And they're like, just a wood plank on the floor. Of course I could, right? And they'll say, great. Now imagine I take that wood plank and I suspend it 100 feet in the air between two buildings. Now could you walk the length of that plank? And they look at him like, what do you mean? I'd have to be crazy. I'd have to be drunk. No way am I walking a hundred foot in the air wood plank. But what has changed about the technical skill required? Absolutely nothing. Right? If you can do it on the ground, you can do it in the air. What's changed are the perceived consequences of failure, which in this case is plummeting to your death. So I kind of get it, right? <laughs> but I would submit to you that many of us go through our days artificially escalating planks, artificially escalating the perceived consequences of failure to the point that we don't act. We don't take risks. We don't try things. We allow fear to paralyze us. We have to come against fear and find our voice if we want to make the contribution we're capable of. We have to notice the areas where we're afraid, and then we have to act squarely in their direction. We have to follow the arrows, as Jad Abumrad of Radiolab says. We have to follow the arrows and find our voice. So here are a couple of arrows I want to give you. Number one, what angers you? Now, I'm not talking about road rage, by the way. Like, ah, somebody cut me off on 75, ah, right? That's not what I mean, which that's exactly how I sound, by the way, when somebody cuts me off. My family's like, what is it? The Hulk, Hulk smash. Um, no, what I'm talking about is this, compassionate anger. 
Compassion, suffer with. What, are you, what angers you to the point that you're willing to suffer on behalf of someone else? Compassionate anger, suffer with. Right? What, what do you see that makes you think, oh, I have to do something about that? That is not right. That's one way, one clue to help you find your voice. Second thing is what makes you cry? Or, or guys, what makes you feel like you have something in your eye, right? <laughs> what moves you emotionally? Hey, that's another great clue. If you haven't done the exercise, go back and look at all the points in your life where you've been moved emotionally and see if you can find the connective tissue there and see if you can apply that to your work. It's a great clue to help you find your voice. What have you mastered? There's this kind of cynical, snarky edge sometimes in creative communities that says, well, that's too obvious. Well, I thought of that three years ago. Yeah, but you didn't do it, right? I mean, really. I mean, how many people have thought of Twitter and Facebook? Like, millions of people have claimed, oh, I, I thought of that in 2001, even before the web, right? Even before I was thinking about, oh, I'm way ahead of, you know. Well, you didn't do it, right? What have you mastered? What's obvious to you that other people maybe... To you, it seems like, well, this is obvious. Maybe it's not obvious to everyone, right? Act on the things that are obvious to you. Sometimes there's this snark that says, oh, if it's obvious, I'm not going to do it because I don't want to be that guy who's obvious guy, right? Or obvious girl. <laughs> um, but, but we have, sometimes the best place to start is to do what's obvious to us, do what's in front of us. And then what gives you hope? What gives you hope? What is it you look at and say, oh, that, that's what I want to do. That's the thing that gives me hope. It's irrational. I don't understand it, but I'm moving in this direction because this is the thing that gives me hope. All right. The final everyday act of bravery is we have to stay connected. We have to stay connected. As creatives, we need one another. There's a myth of the lone innovator, the myth that, that the best creative work gets done on our own. We don't need other people. It's not true. If you look at the preponderance of value being created in the marketplace, it's the it's groups of people stumbling awkwardly into the unknown together, right? And as Stephen Johnson puts it, pursuing the adjacent possible together. This is what creativity and innovation typically is, valuable contribution. But we have to stay connected to others. As we become more successful in our careers, it's easier and easier to become disconnected from others, right? to, to isolate ourselves, and we cannot let that happen. I love how... Um, Kierkegaard talked about this dynamic. He said, by forming a party, by melting into some group, we avoid not only conscience, but martyrdom. This is why fear of others dominates this world. No one dares to be a genuine self. Everyone is hiding in some kind of togetherness. There's this myth that I encounter with creative teams especially that says tranquility equals health. Okay? Nobody's arguing. Look how healthy we are. Right? No, you are remarkably unhealthy. Right? Some of the most healthy, creative teams that I've encountered are those who are arguing. They're fighting fiercely for their point of view. And when the time comes, they are confidently adaptable. They rally behind the idea that has the most momentum, and they move forward. Because it's not about them. It's about the work. Right? But that only happens if we stay connected to one another, if we're communicating, if we have trust and we have respect. And in order to do that, we have to come out from hiding. We have to be willing to have direct conversations, to share with one another what we're thinking, which means we have to put our guns on the table. If you say something to me, disconfirming of what I believe, I'm not going to shoot you under the table, right? My guns are on the table. I'm willing to listen to you. Who in your life has permission to speak unvarnished truth to you? Anyone? Or do you get defensive, right? On your team, are people willing to fight for their opinions? Or does everyone get defensive the moment somebody starts arguing? Oh, well, I, well, what happened to the tranquility? Oh, right? Um, <laughs> that is a sign of unhealth. It's a sign of unhealth. We need one another. We have to stay connected deeply to one another. Who in your life speaks truth and who inspires you? Okay, those are the questions you can ask. All right, just by way of closing, why? Why do this? Right? Just so we can crank out a little more work today, please a couple more clients, and then go home. Is that what we're doing this for? No. No. It's about something far more important and transformative. Not just to you, not just to your team, I believe to the world. It's about you finding your sweet spot. It's about you finding the area that you play in where you have more value than somebody else because it's your sweet spot. It's the place where you can add the same amount of value as someone else, but you create far more value, right? For, the, for that same amount of effort. That's your sweet spot. And I believe we have not only the opportunity today, but the responsibility to figure out what is my sweet spot? 
What is our team sweet spot? What value do we contribute that nobody else could add? I love how one of my favorite thinkers, Thomas Merton, talked about this. He said, there can be an intense egoism in following everyone else. People are in a hurry to magnify themselves by imitating what is popular and too lazy to think of anything better. Hurry ruins saints as well as artists. They want quick success, and they are in such a hurry to get it, they cannot take time to be true to themselves. And when the madness is upon them, they argue that their very haste is a species of integrity. They want quick success, and they are in such a hurry to get it, they cannot take time to be true to who? Themselves. And when the madness is upon them, they argue their very haste is a species of integrity. We have a finite amount of focus, assets, time, and energy. I'm afraid I'm going to waste it. Uncertainty is bearing down on me. I'm not willing to be myself. I'm just going to imitate because it's the quicker, the more comfortable path. It's the path of ego. It's the path of fear. It's the path of aimlessness. It's the path of boredom. I just want to deal with it, right? Medius ochris. Mediocrity. That's why since the beginning of our company, we've had a saying, cover bands don't change the world, right? And a cover band's a band that plays other people's music, and that's fine. There's nothing wrong with it. But nobody goes home talking about the cover band, right? People say, well, what about the Beatles? The Beatles were a cover Yeah, they were a cover band, but at some point, at some point, they spent years playing Chuck Berry, Elvis Presley, Little Richard. At some point, they had to say, we're going to step out of that now. We're going to do something. We're going to find our voice. If they didn't, we wouldn't be talking about them today. We all need the courage to say, hey, this is fine, but I have to step out and find my own voice. So one final thought for you. A couple of years ago, a friend of mine was leading a meeting, and he asked kind of a weird out-of-the-blue question. He said, what do you think is the most valuable land in the world? We thought, that's a weird question. I don't know. Most valuable land in the world? He said, well, just go with me on this. We started throwing out answers. So we said, um, gold mines of South Africa. Wrong. Uh, oil fields of the Middle East. Wrong. Manhattan. Wrong. LPK headquarters. Wrong. <laughs> right? So finally, you know, after a lot of guesses, he kind of realized we're not going to get it. He said, I'll tell you what I think. He said, I think the most valuable land in the world, ultimately, is the graveyard. Because in the graveyard are buried all of the unlaunched businesses, all of the unexecuted ideas, all of the unreconciled relationships, all of the things that people thought, I'm going to get around to that tomorrow. Tomorrow, I will start that. Tomorrow, I will have the courage to make progress on this thing that matters to me. And they pushed it, and they pushed it, and they pushed it into the future until one day they reached the bookend of their life. And all of that value was buried with them, dead in the ground, never to be seen by humans. As my friend Brian likes to say, you know, the death rate is hovering right around 100%. Um, and that day, I went... Back to my office, I wrote two words on an index card. I put them on the wall of my office. They've been the defining ethic of my life for the last decade. And those two words were die empty. Because I want to know at the end of my life, when my days have expired, I'm not taking my best work to the grave with me. I've done everything I can on a day-to-day -day basis to confront the uncertainty with bravery, to get my best work out of me, to pour myself fully into my work, to define my battles, to be fiercely curious, to step away from my comfort zone, to know myself and understand my aptitudes, to be confidently adaptable, to find my voice, and to stay connected to other people people so that I don't settle medius ochris. I will win those battles on a day-to-day -day basis as a creative because I believe I have something to contribute to the world. And if I don't have the bravery to confront those battles, it will never be seen by human eyes. So friends, as a fellow creative, we need you. We need you to contribute. The world needs you to contribute. Not to make someone else's contribution, to make your contribution. What will you do today to be brave, to fight those everyday battles so that in the hopefully far distant future, when you lay your head down for the last time, you can point to a delta, you can point to a body of work, and you can say, yes, that represents what I care about. I was brave on a daily basis. I fought the battles that needed to be fought. I didn't settle medias ochris. And I can lay my head down empty, knowing I've poured myself fully into my work. And if you do that, you can lay your head down empty of regret, but full of satisfaction for a life well lived.
thank you very much. Appreciate your time. Do we want to do a Q&A or? Okay, so I think we have a couple minutes if anybody has thoughts or questions or comments. Jokes would be good. More magic tricks, love those. <laughs> who had, who had, yes? So I, I was thinking, like, I, I love this kind of stuff. And I think we're all, everyone in this room is really fortunate to do what we do. Yeah. Um, lately I've been thinking about, you know, people who, who, who can't, like, sit at the desk all day and design things on the computer, like people in the service industry, people do labor, um, people just pushing paper. Is there like a, like a conflict between like creative types and them? Does this apply to like everyone in general? Or the, qu the question is, does, it, does this apply to people who are maybe in the service industry, people who are you know, doing things like construction, or you know, people who are doing things maybe where you don't have the kind of latitude to create the kind of value you want. You're told basically what to do every day, right? Um, the short answer is yes, absolutely unquestionably. Those people are building a body of work. Your body of work is any place in your life you add value, right? So that's your family. It's your job, obviously. That's the most physical manifestation. Some people don't have the latitude in their job to be able to create the kind of value, at least the tangible value, right, that, that a lot of people look at and say, oh, look what you built. That's amazing. A lot of people don't have that, but they have the latitude to choose how they will engage their work that day. Right? Not just what they do, but how they bring themselves to it and why they do it. And so there are people who build brilliant bodies of work that you and I will never see. We'll ne we will never get to understand the full impact or full magnitude of the body of work that they've built because they did it in a, a largely invisible way. You know, that server who comes to work every day and j honestly just eats crap all day long from the people in the restaurant that she's serving. And they treat her terribly and they disrespect her and they tip her poorly, and she chooses to bring herself fully to her work and say, my job, I'm not here to get my ego stroked. I am here to add value, to be confident, to add as much value as I can in every interaction. She's building a body of work that she can be proud of, or he can be proud of in those circumstances, right? And so uh, we as humans, we are wired to derive a sense of meaning and identity from our labor. We are. I mean, and it doesn't mean like, oh, I am a designer. Oh, I am a writer. That's my identity. It's how we bring ourselves to what we do that helps us define who we are, define our space in the world. And for some people, that's their family. They work a job their entire life that pays their bills so they can go home and build in, build people, you know, help build people of character, good citizens, right? That's fine. That's brilliant. But you have to define your battles. That, when you say yes to that, you're saying no to something else. Right? And that's uh, when I say define your battles, the reason we don't like to define our battles and say my family is the most important thing to me is because that means I'm saying no to all of these other opportunities. Or the reason we don't say yes to workplace responsibilities is because we're saying no to other things or other jobs or other, you know? So that was a very long-winded way of saying, um, yes, I believe that they are absolutely building a body of work. And those of us who have the ability to choose the kind of value we create every day, I believe we carry a special responsibility. With that, you know, Spider-Man, with great power comes great responsibility, right? I think that that, that is very true. So, uh, does that answer your question? Yeah. Okay. Yes, sir. What do you think it takes to, uh, to bring creativity out in our kids? <laughs> Yeah, the question is, what do you think it takes to bring creativity out in our kids for the next generation? I think, um, so I'm not an expert in education, right? Um, but I will say this. Um, we are training our kids that there is a right answer. And I, I think that that's very dangerous. The reality is there is a right answer. The problem is we're teaching them how to shortcut to the answer rather than teaching them how to find the answer. Um, and, and the problem is most of the roles that are emerging in the world today are not problem solving roles, they're problem finding roles. Um, and so we're not teaching our kids to think holistically within context about issues and arrive at the answer. Instead, we're telling them, this is the answer, here's how you get it, just go solve this problem. And I, think, I think that's a problem. And so my, my belief is that we need to teach kids to be comfortable with uncertainty, to be comfortable with playing around with ideas, um, to, to ask questions about 
problems and not, and not tell them, don't ask that question because we just need you to get this answer right. No, we should tolerate questions because questions are what change the world. The people who ask the best questions are ultimately the people who win because they get closest to the truth. But we're, we're kind of, in some ways, we're teaching people not to ask questions. And I think that's, that's, a, that's a dangerous thing. So I, one of the things I do, with, I mean, on a personal level with my kids, every night when we lay down, I try to spend time with each of them. And I, one of the questions I ask them is, do you have any questions for me? But let's talk. What, what questions do you have about the world? You know, whatever it is, and sometimes it's really stupid, mundane stuff. Like, if this Pokemon fought this Pokemon, who do you think would win? Okay, that's fine. <laughs> but sometimes it's just really amazing stuff. Like, why is this the case? Or why is, you know, and, um, and I'll tell them. Sometimes I'll say, I don't know the answer, but what, tomorrow let's look it up. We'll look it up and find the answer to it. But I want to encourage them to ask questions. And I think to bring creativity out of future generations, we need to encourage them to ask questions. The second thing is we have to stop telling them you can be anything you want to be. And I, I believe that to the, I think that we say that with the best intent. I think we say, oh, hey, if you just work hard, but then they get to their teenage years and they realize, actually, my friends are absolutely smoking me in this. I wanted to be a mathematician, but my brain is not firing that way, right? Or um, I want to be an Olympic athlete, but I'm always 30 yards behind the, you know, and I, we, we, we do that with the best of intent. We want you to feel good about yourself. But that doesn't serve us in life. Like, as a leader of a team, your job isn't to make people feel good about themselves. It's to help them get the best out of themselves. And I think we have to lead our kids and help them understand, hey, play around with a lot of stuff. Figure out what you're good at. But at some point, we have to say, hey, here's what it seems like you're really good at. Maybe you should focus your efforts here because I think you could really make a contribution in this space, right? Rather than trying to be something that culture values, Right? Or, or society says is important, like a you know, rock star or whatever. Right? Maybe you need to focus your efforts in this place where you really seem to be showing some aptitude. And that's how you discover passion, is by do, solving important problems and applying yourself to those problems and bringing yourself to it. And then passion emerges in the midst of that. So again, long-winded answer, but I, I think that's really what we have to do. Teach them to ask better questions and then help them focus their energies in places where they're showing aptitude. And again, I'm not an expert, <laughs> so. <laughs> My favorite book of, of all time? Um, <clears throat> any, any genre? Okay, um, I, probably Man's Search for Meaning by Viktor Frankl. This is a fantastic book. He, um, the thing that I got most out of that is he, so for those of you who don't know, Viktor Frankl was in, in, uh, in concentration camps, World War II, lost most of his family, uh, was in just, I mean, hellish situations. We can't even fathom, you know, we can't even fathom what it was like. Um, he survived the concentration camp and wrote about his experiences in this book and wrote about why some people in these camps continued to show hope and continued to have a sense that, hey, everything is ultimately going to be okay, and why some people survived and why some people died. And what was interesting is one of the things he points out is the people who had these irrational hopes, like, oh, we'll be out by Christmas, right? It's, we're going to be out by Christmas. It's going to be fine. Those are the ones who, who died um, and the ones who, who were able to latch on to some reason for their suffering, something that caused them to suffer, um, even, even if it seemed maybe irrational, like I am suffering so that my family can live, or I am suffering so that, right? Those are the ones who tended to survive because they ascribed a kind of meaning to their suffering. And uh, the, the big question that he asks in that book is, we have to get to the point where we stop asking, what do I want out of life? And we have to instead ask, what does life want out of me? What is life asking of me? Um, and he says he, he believes that that's the question that we have to ask if we want to find meaning in our life. So, yeah, so that's probably my, my fa one of my favorite books, for sure. Yes, sir. I don't mean this to sound snarky at all. Yeah. But I've been thinking about this ever since I saw the title of your book, and I haven't read it yet. But uh, just the term die empty kind of <coughs> says to me, like, oh, I'm empty, I can quit now. Whereas the more I know about creativity, there's always one more idea that you can right. keep pushing yourself. Right. So how do you address that or like, how much you talk about that? Yeah, so, uh, and, and this is. Um, and I actually had a lot of conversations with Penguin about the, the title. Um, and even like, I mean, frankly, like people were, you know, some book buyers from big bookstores uh, were coming in saying, like, we're gonna die empty. I mean, people aren't going to, you know. So I, I, I get that, I understand. And honestly, I, I chose the title because it was very 
polarizing, you know? Um, and sometimes you have to speak really strongly in order to elicit a response. I, I agree with you. I hope I die with more hopes, aspirations, dreams, ideas than I had the day before. And I, I hope that, I, I really hope I, I'm not peaking right now, right? Like I hope, I hope, for all of our sake, I hope this isn't the best that I ever have to, you know? Um, but I want to die with more hopes, dreams, ambitions, aspirations. The, the point is I die empty of regret, right? I can point to what I've done and say, I don't have any regrets about where I put my focus, assets, time, energy. That, that, at the very least, my body of work represents what I care about. And I'm not dying saying, oh, I wish I had been more purposeful about where I spent my days. So I, I understand that response. And actually, that was one of the considerations we had when, when naming the book, because it could kind of be, there's also a Japanese term, karoshi, which means death from overwork. And there's this real phenomenon where people are dying because they're working themselves to death. And my other concern was people would misinterpret it as spend it all every day and go to bed, collapse in your bed every night because you view. And, and that's not true either because realistically, part of building your body of work sometimes means, hey, it's time to kick up your heels and watch an episode of Breaking Bad on Netflix, right? No spoilers in case you haven't seen the whole thing. Um, it's amazing. It gets better. It's like a fine wine. gets better with time. Um, so... You know, sometimes that's part of building a body of work is I just need to kick, out, kick my legs up right now and just relax. And some people would say, well, you're not dying empty. You have things you could be doing. Well, no, because it's not just about your job. It's, not, you know, it's about building a body of work over time. So, yeah, so I, I understand that. But it's not about getting everything done. It's about not regretting. Jeff Bezos, um, when he founded Amazon, it's an interesting story. He was thinking about leaving his corporate job, and he had like a $25,000 bonus or something he was going to get that quarter if he, if he stuck around. But he was thinking about leaving to go start this internet thing. He created what he called the regret minimization framework, which totally sounds like a Jeff Bezos thing to do, right? But what he did is he projected himself out to age 80. And he said, when I look back on my life at age 80, which of these two decisions will I regret more? Will I regret walking away from $25,000 or whatever the amount was, which is a lot of money, right? But at the end of my life, will I regret walking away from that or will I re regret not taking a chance on this internet thing that I think could be really, really big? And I think if more of us lived our lives with that kind of framework in mind, I think that we would eventually progress to a place where we would die empty of regret, which I think is all we can ask for. So. Yes, sir? My issue, my battle line is, uh, well, I tell people I'm an arms dealer for the creative revolution, right? It's kind of my little snarky tagline, um, but it's freedom. It's, I love seeing people be freed up. I love seeing um, underdogs overcoming the odds. And frankly, when I go into a lot of especially creative services businesses, um, which I don't really get to work with a lot of agencies and creative services businesses um, these days, which is kind of funny. I'm working with more sort of like big corporate conglomerate, which is good because I can like move bigger rocks around, which is great. But um, I see a, a groups of people who are consistently, I mean, frankly, kind of trod upon, you know, like we're going to squeeze the energy out of you and we're going to use it to make this great stuff and then we're going to, you know, bring in a new crop or whatever which I think is, is really sad. So I, I am passionate about helping people realize what it is they're capable of. And like I said, go back and look at the times you've been moved emotionally. I mean, some of the movies that have, have moved me emotionally the most are like, um, okay, we're going to get back to the sports thing here. Sorry, I'm, I'm not like a huge sports guy, but like um, Rudy, you know, the, the guy from Notre Dame who, you know, I mean, it's like I watch, every time I watch that movie, I've seen it probably a dozen times, and every time at the end, I'm like, ah. You know, my wife will be like, what's wrong? Did somebody die? No, it's okay. It's just Rudy, the guy. He's so small, but he ran the ball. Is it? Yeah, so, um, you know, Hoosiers, you know, or, or like the pursuit of happiness, right? Where this guy is like down in his luck. He's at his last, you know, and, uh, and he fights his way. That's what moves me emotionally. And so when I see creatives who are like, hey, this is against the grain. This is against the tide. This is, this is countercultural, but this is where I need to go. Because this is what I believe is, is the deposit that's in me that needs to, you know, it's my voice. I'm finding vocare to call. I'm finding what's being called out of me uh, and it's resonating. That's what moves me. So freedom, freeing people up to be who they are and do what they're capable of. That's my, my battle line. So, and I will always fight for freedom. Always. So I think we're done. <laughs> hey, thank you very much. Thanks again for coming out this morning.